No DeGrasse Tyson, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. This is Eric Michael Lloyd, Masters, student, uh, Masters in Clinical Psychology, Neuropsychology, Concentration. I'm going to go ahead and read Chapter 2. On Earth as it is in the Heavens by Neil deGrasse Tyson. New York Times bestseller. This book uh, I initially got from my dad for Father's Day, but I ended up sending him something else for some reason. Um, but I'm going to read this. It's a great book, and when I do see him, I'll give him this book as well to read. Um, <clears throat> Until Sir Isaac Newton wrote down the universal law of gravitation. Nobody had any reason to presume that the laws of physics at home were the same as everywhere else in the universe. Earth had earthly things going on, and the heavens had heavenly things going on. According to Christian teachings of the day, God controlled the heavens, rendering them unknowable to our feeble mortal minds. When Newton breached this philosophical barrier, by rendering all motion comprehensible and predictable. Some theologians criticized him for leaving nothing for the creator to do. Newton had figured out that the force of gravity pulling ripe apples from their orchards also guides tossed objects along their curved trajectories and directs the moon in its orbit around Earth. By the way, tonight the moon is a full moon and it's a clear sky in Miami, Florida. May 6, 2020. Newton's law of gravity also guides planes, asteroids, and comets in their orbits around the sun and keeps hundreds of billions of stars in orbit within our Milky Way galaxy. This universal universality of physical laws drives scientific discovery like nothing else. And gravity was just the beginning. Imagine the excitement among 19th century astronomers when Laboratory prisms, which break light beams into spectrums of colors, were first turned to the sun. Spectra are not only beautiful, but contain oodles of information about light emitting object, about the light emitting object, including its temperature and composition. Chemical elements reveal themselves in their unique patterns of light or dark bands that cut across the spectrum. To people's delight and amazement, the chemical signatures of the sun were identical to those in the laboratory. No longer the exclusive tool of chemists, the prism showed that as different as the sun as different as the sun is from the earth in size, mass, temperature, location, and appearance, we both contain the same stuff. Hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, calcium, iron, and so forth. But more important than our laundry list of shared ingredients was the recognition that the laws of physics prescribing the formation of these spectral signatures on the sun were the same laws operating on Earth, 93 million miles away. So fertile was this concept of universality that it was successfully applied in reverse. Further analysis of the sun's spectrum revealed that the signature of an element that had no known counterpart, counterpart on Earth. Being of the sun, the new substance was given a name derived from the Greek word helios, the sun, and was only later discovered in the lab. Thus, helium became the first and only element in the chemist's periodic table to be discovered someplace other than Earth. Okay, the laws of physics work in the solar system, but do they work across the galaxy? Across the universe? Across time itself? Step by step, the laws are tested. Nearby stars also reveal, revealed familiar chemicals. Distant binary stars bound in mutual orbit, seem to know all about Newton's laws of gravity. For the same reason, so do binary galaxies. 
By the way, I just was looking on Live Science earlier today, LiveScience.com. Turns out that the closest black hole is 1,000 light years away, and that black hole, uh, black holes, uh, basically suck in everything uh, at super warp speeds. Uh, faster than anything, uh, light can't escape it. Uh, a light year is the distance that light can travel in one year. The distance that light can travel in one second is known, and that's 186,232 miles per second. So you multiply that times whatever huge number you need to get that distance that it travels in an entire year, and that's one light year, which is a distance, not an actual um, unit of time. Then you multiply that number times a thousand, and then you'll know how far away the nearest black hole is, which is 1,000 light years away. And you can look up that on life science or any, um, any uh, NASA or uh, science magazine or anything like that. Um, so reading along here, and like the geologist stratified sediments, which serve as a timeline of earthly events, the farther away we look in space, the further back in time we see. Spectra from the most distant objects in the universe show the same chemical signatures that we see nearby in space and in time. True heavy elements were less abundant back then. They are manufactured primarily in subsequent generations of exploding stars, but the laws describing the atomic and molecular processes that created these spectral signatures remain intact. In particular, a quantity known as the fine structure constant, which controls the basic fingerprinting for every element, must have remained unchanged for billions of years. Of course, not all things and phenomena in the cosmos have counterparts on Earth. You've probably never walked through a cloud of glowing million degree plasma. I bet you'd never greeted a black hole on the street. What matters is the universality of the physical laws that describe them. When spectral analysis was first applied to the light emitted by interstellar nebula, a signature was discovered that once again had no counterpart on Earth. At the time, the periodic table of elements had no obvious place for a new element to fit. In response, astrophysicists invented the name nebulium, uh, neb nebulium, as a placeholder until they could figure out what was going on. It turned out that in space, gases nebula, nebula are so, so rarefied that atoms go long stretches without colliding. Under these conditions, Electrons can do things with atoms that have never been seen in Earth labs. Nib nebul nebulium was simply the signature of ordinary oxygen doing extraordinary things. Nebulium. N-E-B-U-L-I-U-M. The universality of physical laws tells us that if we land on another planet with a thriving alien civilization, they will be running on the same laws that we have discovered and tested here on Earth, even if the aliens harbor different social and political beliefs. <laughs> Furthermore, if you wanted to talk to the aliens, you can bet they don't speak English or French or even Mandarin, nor would you know whether shaking their hands, nor would you know whether shaking their hands, if indeed their outstretched appendage is a hand, would be considered an act of war or of peace? 
Your best hope is to find a way to communicate using the same language of science. Such an attempt was made in the 1970s with Pioneer 10 and 11 and Voyager 1 and 2. All four spacecraft were endowed with enough energy after gravity assists from the giant planets to escape the solar system entirely. Pioneer wore a golden etched plaque that showed in scientific pictograms the layout of our solar system, our location in the Milky Way galaxy, and the structure of the hydrogen atom. Voyager went further and also included a gold record album containing diverse sounds from Mother Earth, including the human heartbeat, whale songs, and musical selections from around the world, including the works of Beethoven and Chuck Berry. While this humanized the message, it's not clear whether alien ears would have a clue what they were listening to, assuming they have ears in the first place. My favorite parody of this gesture was a skit on NBC's Saturday Night Live, shortly after the Voyager launch, in which they showed a written reply from the aliens who recovered the spacecraft. The note simply requested, send more Chuck Berry. <laughs> Science thrives not only in the universality of physical laws, but also on the existence and persistence of physical constants. The constant of gravitation, known by most scientists as Big G, supplies Newton's equation of gravity with the measure of how strong the force will be. This quantity has been implicitly tested for variation over eons. If you do the math, you can determine that a star's luminosity is steeply dependent on Big G. In other words, if Big G had been even slightly different in the past, then the energy output of the sun would have been far more variable than any, anything the biological, climatological, or geological records indicate, such as the uniformity of our universe. Among all constants, the speed of light is the most famous. No matter how fast you go, you will never overtake a beam of light. So Einstein wanted to know what it was like to travel alongside a beam of light. It's a question he continued to ask himself. Why not? No experiment ever conducted had ever revealed an object of any form reaching the speed of light. It's also 300,000 kilometers per second. Well-tested laws of physics predict and account for that fact. I know these statements sound close-minded. Some of the most boneheaded science-based proclamations in the past have underestimated the ingenuity of inventors and engineers. We will never fly. Flying will never be commercially feasible. We will never split the atom. We will never break the sound barrier. We will never go to the moon. What they have in common is that no established law of physics stood in their way. The claim, we will never outrun a beam of light is qualitative, qualitatively different, is a qualitatively different prediction. It flows from basic time-tested physical principles. Highway signs for interstellar travelers of the future will justifiably read the speed of light. It's not just a good idea, it's the law. <laughs> um, so that's all I'll read for now and I'll continue reading a little bit more. Let me uh, beat this coronavirus pandemic shut down. Thank you.